Here we're gonna look at a problem from the 2016 Putnam exam. So this is question B1. And our goal is to show that the curve x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed equals one contains only one set of distinct points A, B, C, such that the triangle A, B, C is equilateral. And then our secondary goal is to find the area of this triangle. So in general, a cubic curve is going to be quite complicated. So that, along with the fact that this is question B1, and A1 and B1 are generally the easiest problems on the Putnam, that means there's probably some simplification for this. So let's maybe see what we could do. So keeping in mind that this is like a polynomial in two variables, we'll attack this like it's a polynomial, that is, we'll set it equal to zero and see what we can do. So equivalently, we want to describe the solution set to x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed minus 1 equals 0. And so now, like I said, this solution set is going to be quite difficult to describe unless there's some simplification. And there's a hint that there should be some simplification by the fact that this is a B1 problem. So maybe what would be a very nice simplification? Well, I would say a very nice simplification would be if this left-hand side could factor into a linear polynomial in two variables times a quadratic polynomial in two variables. Because we know exactly what the solution set of a linear polynomial looks like. We know exactly what the solution set of a quadratic polynomial looks like. But in fact, the solution set of a cubic polynomial, like I said before, is pretty complicated. So let's say, see if we can do this. Another thing that we want to keep in mind is that this polynomial is symmetric in x and y. That is, if I switch x with y, I end up with the same polynomial. That tells me that this probably factors into two polynomials that are also symmetric in x and y. So that's how we will motivate our factorization. So we'll take x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed minus 1 equals, needs to be that linear polynomial in two variables. So I'm going to write it as x plus y plus, I'll call it capital A, and you might say, well, how do I know that I can take the coefficient of x and y both to be 1? Well, I can take the coefficient to be the same because I know this should be invariant under switching x and y. I can take it to be 1 because we know that the coefficient of x cubed and y cubed is 1. And so I've got a little bit of freedom there. So likewise, I can take the coefficient of x squared and y squared to also be 1. Notice the coefficient of x squared and y squared also have to be the same because of the symmetry. And furthermore, the coefficient of x and x squared need to multiply to 1, so we might as well like factor that out so that we can just set them equal to 1. Okay, so that's the beginning of our quadratic polynomial. And then next we could have maybe bxy plus cx plus cy plus d. Again, by the symmetry, we know the coefficient of x and y are the same. That's why I had both of those being equal to the coefficient c. Okay, so next I'm going to give these guys a name. Maybe I'll call this thing f of xy, and I'll call this polynomial right here g of xy. And we want to enforce the equation f of xy times g of xy equals this thing over here on the left-hand side of the equation. So that's x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed minus 1. Now we're going to use some techniques that are pretty standard for like partial fraction decomposition. That is, we'll think about multiplying out f of xy times g of xy and extracting coefficients of x cubed, y cubed, and so on and so forth, and setting them equal to coefficients of x cubed, y cubed, x squared, x, xy, and so on and so forth on the right-hand side. So I'm not going to totally multiply this out because we can kind of eyeball it and see what's going on. But maybe what I want to point out over here is the start of this factorization. So notice we've got x cubed plus y cubed. That's just from x times x squared and y times y squared. Then let's see what the coefficient of x, y is. So the coefficient of x, y is going to have an a, b term in it. And then it'll also have 
2c, so I can write this as plus 2c times xy. So we get that from a times bxy and then cx times y and cy times x. And then we've got a bunch of other terms too. I'll let you guys calculate those out in full if you need to, although it's easy to just pick them off as needed. Now what we'll do is extract appropriate coefficients from both sides of this equation. So I'll write it like this. I'll say one is extracting the constant term from both sides of the equation. So if we multiply these two guys together, there will only be one constant term and that is a times d. So that's what we get on this f times g side of the equation. And then on the right hand side of the equation, we'll have that this is equal to negative one. Okay, cool. And then let's look at the coefficient of x comma y. I'll write as x and y, not x times y. And that's because again, we have some symmetry here. So we only really need to look at one of them. Okay, so the coefficient of x, well, that's gonna be x times d. So that'll be dx, and then it'll be a times cx. So we'll have ac plus d. So let's write that down, ac plus d. But then the coefficient of x on the right-hand side is zero. And then you can check that the coefficient of y is exactly the same, so that cuts down on the amount of work that we need to do. Okay, great. So now let's look at maybe the coefficient of x squared or y squared. Again, we only need to look at one of them because of the symmetry. So let's see, over here we're gonna have a times x squared, so we'll have a as the coefficient of x squared. And then what else will we have? We'll also have c times x, so we'll have a plus c, like that. And that's from this x times cx. Then we have something similar for y squared. But over here on the left-hand side of the equation or on this, hand, this side of the equation, there is no x squared or y squared term. So we have this is equal to zero. Now let's look at the x times y coefficient on both sides of the equation. So I calculated that over here. So this is a, b plus two, c. And then over here, it's equal to three. And then we've actually got one more equation which we can look at, and that would be the x squared times y or the x times y squared. So I'll just write it as the x squared times y. So that's like a cubic term. So let's see what we get for that. So we'll have x squared times y, we'll have one, so that's pretty nice. And then we'll also have x times b x y, so that's plus b. And then over on this side of the equation, we have zero. So that tells us immediately that b is equal to zero. So that tells us immediately that b is equal to negative one. So now we can start looping these back together to solve for our variables. So we have b is equal to negative one. So maybe plugging that into here, we see that minus a plus 2c equals 3. And then notice this equation right here tells us that c is equal to negative a. So throwing this in here, we get minus 3a is equal to 3, which tells us that a is also equal to negative 1. Okay, so we got b is negative 1, a is negative 1. Notice this equation right here tells us that D is equal to one. And then this equation right here tells us that C is equal to one. So that gives us our complete factorization for our goal object right here. So we can fill these in if we wanted to. This is gonna be negative one right here. This guy right here will be negative one. And then these will both be one like that. Okay, so now let's maybe go ahead and clean this up and we'll start from that. So far, we have shown that our polynomial equation is equivalent to this polynomial equation where we have factored it into a linear factor and a quadratic factor. So that means if we were to graph this, we would have the graph of this linear factor being equal to zero, which is a line, and then the graph of this quadratic factor being equal to zero, which, well, we'll have to figure what that is. Maybe it's a hyperbola, maybe it's a parabola, maybe it's an ellipse, or maybe it's something that's a little bit degenerate. Like, like I said, we're gonna have to play around with it. And that's actually our goal now, is to figure out what this equal to zero looks like. So let's do that. Maybe I'll say investigate, 
and then x squared minus xy plus y squared plus x plus y plus one equals zero. So I think there's probably a bunch of ways to play around with this to get at what exactly this equation is. But the way I did it is thought about it as a polynomial, which is quadratic, where y is the variable and x is like not quite a variable, and then use the quadratic formula. So let's see what that looks like. So we'll have y squared plus, what's the coefficient of y? It is one minus x, so that's from this term and this term. And then what is the constant term? So the constant term is x squared plus x plus one. So we have that's equal to zero. So again, we just kind of gathered all of the exponents of y together. Okay, so now we can use the quadratic formula here. That'll give us two branches of this. So maybe those two branches form the two branches of a hyperbola. Maybe they glue together into an ellipse. Or maybe it's degenerate and they're the same branch which makes a parabola but we can use the quadratic formula either way. So that's gonna give us y equals, well, it'll be negative the b term, so that's x minus y plus minus the square root of, well, the b term, that's gonna be one minus x quantity squared minus four times a times c, so that's gonna be four x squared plus x plus one, and then this is all over two. So we need to figure out what that looks like. Okay, so let's play around with it a little bit. And what you can see is that the interior of this square root simplifies quite a bit. So I'll let you guys check, but this simplifies to negative three times the quantity x plus one squared. So let's write that down. We have y equals x minus one plus or minus the square root of negative three times x plus one squared, and then this is gonna be all over two. But here's the issue. This x plus one quantity squared is always positive unless x is equal to negative one. And why is that? Well, that's because we're squaring something. And why is that a problem? Well, that's because we're multiplying it by negative three. So that means the interior of this square root is always negative unless x is equal to negative one. But since we're working over the real numbers here, that is our curve is in the real plane and not some sort of C2 or something, that means that we have x must be equal to negative one. Otherwise, we have y is equal to a complex number with non-zero imaginary part. Okay, so if x is equal to negative one, well, that makes this part disappear. We have negative two over two, so that makes y equal to negative one as well. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? Well, the takeaway is that the graph of this portion of our curve, in other words, that stuff being equal to zero, is only a single point negative one comma negative one. So let's maybe get rid of this calculation and then we'll see where that takes us. We've argued that our curve looks like the product of these two curves. So we know that this one that I've underlined in blue now is a line, then we just finished investigating that this quadratic one is a single point. So let's go ahead and graph this to see what's going on. So there's my x, y plane. So my single point is negative one comma negative one. So I'll maybe go ahead and put that over here and I'll color code it in green as well, just as I underlined that in green. And so that is the curve well, which is a single point here, which is that green underline equals zero. Now we need the curve of this blue underline equals zero, but that's just the line x plus y equals one. So let's see, we need another one and a one here. And that'll give us, like I said, this line right here. Let's see how we can make a triangle from this curve. Well, one thing that is immediate, immediately clear is that one vertex of our triangle has to be this point right here, which is negative one comma one. So let's maybe write that. We'll call this A. This is the point negative one comma one. That means the two other points on our triangle have to be on this line up here. So let's maybe put one of them right here and then one of them right here. Now, since this is an equilateral triangle, we actually have quite a bit of information about it. 
We know that the side length is related to the altitude via the Pythagorean theorem. So let's say there is our triangle. That looks like an equilateral triangle. Well, first off, we know that because of some symmetry here, this point right here, which is the midpoint of BC, will be the point half comma half, which tells us that the height of this triangle will be given by the distance from negative one, one to half, half. So let's maybe calculate that real quick just so that we have that under our belt. So we have H is equal to, like I said, distance from here to here. So that's gonna be, maybe we'll do it like uh, one half minus negative one. So that's gonna be three halves squared plus three halves squared, and then we need to take the square root. Again, that's just by the distance formula here. So it's not so hard to simplify that down to three over the square root of two. So that's gonna be the height of our triangle. Now we need to go about arguing that B and C are unique. So let's say that the length of the sides of these equilateral triangles is equal to A. So that makes this distance here A, this distance here as well A. But again, because we have an equilateral triangle here, we know that this altitude bisects the line segment BC, which makes this distance right here A over two. And furthermore, this other distance is also A over two. Next, it's clear that this is the altitude, which makes that a right angle. So we can apply the Pythagorean theorem to solve for A. And notice, whatever we solve for A will prove the uniqueness of B and C. Because there are unique points that are a distance A over two along this blue line from one half, one half. So there we have the uniqueness. Now we just have to figure out what A over two is, or what A is. So notice by, again, Pythagorean theorem, we'll have A over two quantity squared plus H squared equals A squared. Okay, so that gives us A squared over four plus nine over two equals A squared. Again, we use the value of H. I'll let you guys check this. This is not too hard to check. This tells us that A is equal to the square root of six. So that means the distance from here to here is root six over two. The distance from here to here is also root six over two. And that gives us unique points here and here. Okay, now we can find the area of our triangle. So area of triangle A, B, C is going to be one half base, which in this case we're using the letter A, maybe we should have used the letter B, times the height. So I'll let you guys do the little calculation of that, but what we end up getting is three times the square root of three over two. So we've achieved our area, and that's a good place to stop.